Welcome to the Center Mid Philosopher. This episode is brought to you by Augustus Royale Fashion. Life's not black and white, it's gray, and gray is beautiful. Check out the brand below in the link. Welcome to this week's episode of the Center Mid Philosopher. We've got Grant Porter with us to talk about the world of soccer and uh, his current role as assistant coach at UNC Chapel Hill. But all right, we're going to dive in. So uh, today we've got Grant Porter with us, uh, North Carolina soccer legend. Um, he is a national championship both winner, both as a uh, player, uh, captain of that team in 2001, and as a coach for Carolina, which is amazing. A consistent uh, recruiter of top 10 classes across the country, has played with uh, 16 and, and counting you know, MLS players, and has, has coached uh, upwards, getting close to 30 uh, professional players now. So um, personally, it's awesome to see you doing so well and you know, uh, trust me, I was bragging that I shared the field with you with my sons last night. And um, on a personal note, too, I, I, uh, you, you, you probably already know this. I probably told you this, but you were my least favorite player to play against by far. And unfortunately, I think we played against each other from fourth grade through 12th grade. And I was the poor soul that was uh, at center mid that was charged with marking you, which was um, – ill-fated um and i always knew if i saw you on the other side i was like this is gonna be a long day <laughs> um and i could hang with a lot of people and even do well but with you i was i was always 10 yards behind you so it's uh it's a real pleasure to have you on so thank you yeah man thanks for uh for having me and certainly appreciate the intro it's funny some of my best times even though you're talking about the current state and how how great I, it feels to be at carolina so much of my identity is uh brian park there in greensboro oh, yeah. growing up in the state of north carolina and having those games um and all i dreamed about was trying to at that point try to help our team get in a position to win a state championship at brian park and be there for that final four and certainly part of that process was playing against your teams and um, <laughs> I appreciate the compliments. Sadly, part of it is I, hopefully I was at least a nice person. You were, which made it worse, made it all the more worse. When I frankly. reflect, I'm like, uh, I might not have been the nicest guy out there, but that's part of who I was. No, in fact, I, I would have rather you been a jerk, honestly, because yeah, it would have been yeah. easier to dislike you. But yeah. met you at Carolina, I was like, damn, he's a nice guy. Yeah. And um, I was like, that guy crushed my soul many times. For the listeners, uh, I kind of reconnected with Grant after a while where he was retelling the story of, our senior year in high school, by the way, I was wildly hungover because it was the night after our prom. So I'll blame it on that. No, but we were up to, too. That's not good. so hot. We were up to, <laughs> Oh yeah. My coach, Steve Allison was like, you smell like bourbon. And I was like, that's yeah. fair. Um, but, uh, it was the semifinals. We were up to, Oh, and Grant and his, uh, Mary brand of Charlotte, uh, heart crushers came roaring back and beat us three, two, and then went on to win the state championship. I think the year or two before we lost y'all in the finals, state championship finals as well. And um, we got a couple W's in there, but not not many. Um, but anyway, it's such a thrill to have you on here. And I'm so pumped and rooting for you all the way uh, nice. with all your success at Georgia State, certainly at Carolina. But I always remember you in that uh, blue and red Charlotte uniform, haunt my dreams. Um, but uh, yeah, so I want to just dive into some of the, the current world of soccer right now. Probably the most recent news is, I don't know if you have any thoughts on the recent hiring of uh, Matt Crocker as the new sporting director of the U.S. Soccer Federation. Furthermore, that he's British. And again, we're not in this, the business of being xenophobics. However, I just wonder if that's the best hire given the unique com uh landscape for us soccer uh do you have any thoughts on that hire well first of all i think we're in this world of okay someone gets hired it gets put on social media and everybody just just gets just get to have an opinion yeah. and talk right and say why or why not this person right i try to be a maybe because i'm in the soccer world and maybe because i'm in a coaching profession where you can always be questioned mm-hmm 
I try to be a trustworthy person. So there was a process to why this person was hired. I don't care about where they're from or what, you know, it, they've obviously gone through a process. Uh, there was obviously some things that happened with the, 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 the coaching position. So there, that's obviously going to be at the forefront of his uh, task at hand when he steps foot in Chicago or wherever he's going to be headquartered. I think he's going to be in Chicago. So um, I am one to – to hold my opinion, not because I don't have one, but sure. I, I'm also just want to be a supportive soccer person. I think what happens maybe it's in the sport of soccer or anything, we all just want to jump and say, well, why'd you do this? Or why'd you hire this guy? Why'd you do this guy? Well, let's let the guy get in there and, and, and create his identity and his, his footprint. And then, yeah, we're always going to be kind of going, well, why'd we hire this guy if it doesn't work out? Or if he hires a, a manager that we go on the next world cup and don't qualify God for Britain or, or go to the world yeah. cup and, and don't perform well, then, then everybody's going to kind of go, well, why did we hire this guy in the first place? Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm starting in this, like, let's just get behind this person. I, I don't have a connection to him. I, you know, I've read about it a little bit. Uh, I'm sure he presented why he should be the next person and was sold on it. I don't even know who all the candidates were. So me I'm kind of going in the, okay, I just want to be a supporter of us soccer person. Um, uh, and, and see where the next steps are. Now, if he takes some steps and we all can, you know, maybe this podcast will change in a month based on the hire he makes for the next sure. head coach, for right. example. Right. right. Um, and, and, and that's going to be obviously a, a huge decision. And, um, obviously things that were happening here, man, you're talking about Greg Berhalter, who's a, a Carolina guy. Oh yeah. And great to us. I think we had a good performance in the world cup if we want to talk about that more, but so it's, but he's in the news for some, some other things as well. And, yeah. um, so, I, I'm not going to even go down that path. I think it'll just be interesting to see where this goes. Um, starting with that hire is probably going to be a, a big identity of his tenure. Do you, yeah, you mentioned Burhalter, Chapel Hill guy. I remember watching him. He was awesome. Um, played out of the back. Um, and so pumped for how, I mean, his success. And I, I honestly thought he did a great job. Um, and I, I think we performed really well in the world cup, but do you, do you know Burhalter? Yeah, he's he's a great alum. Um, yeah. What's what's crazy is his son played here um, recently. So when we opened our brand new stadium awesome. in 2019, his son was on the field and he was in the stadium and he was here. Um, he's a proud Tar Heel. Yeah. Um, loves his place. Met his wife here, um, and um, just a really down to earth, nice guy. Easy to talk to. Um, and again, I, I you know everybody's gonna have their opinions about the World Cup, but I think again, we, I thought we would perform well. Mm -hmm. We don't give up that penalty in the first game. Everybody's like, oh, we're off to this great start, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, again, the penalty almost like overshadowed the 84 minutes or whatever whatever right. the exact time was of, of how well we were playing or felt like we were going to get three points. And then all of a sudden you're you're in a good position. And so it made the last game a little stressful. We got there and then we get off to a good start against the Netherlands and then just concede. And then it just felt like it was catch up time. And maybe we were just a little bit, I don't know, can we do this or not? And who mm -hmm. knows what the inside scoop would be from those guys. And. I haven't talked to him personally since the World Cup to to have some kind of inside scoop, but um, I think just from a fan perspective, it, to get out of a group was kind of a, I don't want to say a bare minimum. I think it was just great for our country to, to get to the next phase and um, and and especially coming off the of World Cup where we didn't qualify and, and people forget like there's some big countries that didn't qualify. Yeah, but I didn't see Italy country. there. I mean, yeah, some big countries that didn't get out of their group. You know, so I think we always kind of put the spotlight as American fans of what we didn't do. Um, but let's not forget what we, we were, we were able to accomplish, especially how bad it was four years ago. Well, and you know, this is kind of touching on the theme of the show a little bit that soccer is such an, it's kind of an abstract art form to the American. And it's, there's a lot of wins that don't show up on the data sheet, you know, and we want to quantify a lot of things in America. And I get that. And it's kind of, you know, the Ricky Bobby, if you're not first, you're last, but that's just not how it yeah. is in soccer. Yeah. For me, I thought that game against England was the best we've ever looked. I, we, like we were not only in the, much to the chagrin of the British fans who were interviewed saying not a single one of our players would start for them, which is just a total lie. Right. They, they were dominant. I mean, they were by, we were by far better. And that to me was like, that's a big win, you know, yeah. on that stage. And, you know, we should have won that game, but, um, you know, kind of going back a little bit to, um, the Matt Crocker thing and then kind of weaving into kind of who do you think should be the next U S coach again, you're in, 
uh, choppy water there with Burhalter, whom we all love. And maybe your answer is Burhalter, and that's a good one. But I think the fact that we're even debating these things is kind of a healthy sign of the progress American soccer is making. That you know that people are having opinions on like, no, I, I don't want a Southampton guy. You know, I think that's healthy. But there's obviously you pointed out some unhealthy aspects to that. Um, and I'm all, yeah, like let's, whatever U.S. soccer is, let's get behind it 100%. But, you know, a, a loaded question for you there, too, again, um, you know, because we were, I watched an interview with Matt Crocker on, I think, Men and Blazers, and we were just talking about how he has a lot to learn about the U.S. landscape, the pay to play nature, you know, which really cuts to the core of American business. I mean, there's some really deep rooted American things in our sporting system. And do you think the sporting director or, you know, whoever it is, or the head coach needs to be American going into the 2026 World Cup? Or does it need to be a big name like a Mourinho or a, a, a Vieira or a Thierry Henry? I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Jesus loaded. I mean, I think. <laughs> I think I think I think having people that understand our players and our culture is important. Now, to your point in terms of how our game and our sport and our country is progressing, a lot of our players are not necessarily playing in the United States now. So, uh, do we need someone who understands what they're going through on a weekly, ba a daily basis, mm -hmm. in a weekly basis, whether they're because of their leagues and if they're playing on Saturdays and potentially Tuesdays for champions, you know, whatever it might mm -hmm. be. So um, I'm not, um, it has to be this person from this country, but I think they should have to prove why um, their situation would help them understand our players and our country and our ability and how important qualifying is and how important getting out of the group is. And, mm -hmm. and can we take that next step to feel like, a quarterfinal of like 2002 is a little bit more realistic. I'm not saying it wasn't realistic this time, but God, we're kind of holding our breath. Like, can we get out of the group? And can we get to the point where, yeah, yeah we feel like quarterfinals and, and then all of a sudden you're starting to toss the coin in the air and maybe you're in a semifinal and then, yeah. you know. Um, and so I would just want them to prove to me, if I was in the interview room, why their situation helps them understand that job in a better, better way. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe someone would argue that by not knowing our culture, they're a good. But tell me why. Tell me why not mm -hmm. knowing our culture and and that you're going to come in with like a, a, a kind of a blind view and then just um, have your own thoughts and own opinions. But you're going to have to convince a lot of people. Our country is huge, you know. And yeah. It's a lot of people. You have to try to youth directors. I mean, youth national teams. How are you going to how are you going to get these youth national teams on the same page and create this kind of pyramid, however you want to describe it, of, of and then ultimately what is shown at the top stages are men's and women's national teams mm -hmm. that kind of evaluate as to how we're doing, even though I don't know if that's always fair. Uh, we could have a U17 team win the World Cup, but our men's national team struggles. Well, maybe there's still something good happening and about to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but yet at the end of the day, someone who doesn't know much about sports turns on the World Cup and that's, you know, we played England on, was it Thanksgiving Day, I think? I mean, that's a big opportunity. Mm -hmm to play well. And we did, you know, and so that was a big moment. Um, mm -hmm. hopefully we gave some fans there. People were sitting around and I mean, I think it was the day after Thanksgiving, excuse me. And so I think that's a big moment where we're, Even we're better, all really. holiday and can watch it at one o'clock and not, that doesn't always happen in a world cup draw, you know, so that's right. Four in the morning, whatever it was in South Korea against Portugal. Mm -hmm. kind of yeah. Trying to keep your eyes open, you know? Yeah. You know, I, it, it, an interesting component too is like what role does recruiting dual nationals have in the head coach which i thought back in the thomas dooley days in the you know um you know, back when we were kids with the 1994 world cup and we we're you know that was a thing like we, we needed to get some of these guys and i guess i'm kind of i guess it's that way everywhere but it's it's shocking to me that how much of a thing that still is and you know, like Cherry on Ree's name is surfaced as somebody that could land, you know, the likes of um, Falun, you know, uh, at in France, this is dual national and then others. And I, I think that's kind of a wild thing, but it is a thing. I mean, do you feel like that's a would you where would you put that out of 10 factors on, you know, you're you're in the world of recruiting. I mean, too, yeah. like where how important is that? Just in my mind, I'm going, you need to have a database of any potential player that has an American connection or possible citizenship, mm -hmm. and they need to be on a list of evaluation at a high level mm -hmm. yeah. to see if we even want that player to be in the pool. So I, 
I personally don't know every player that's out there that has a potential dual citizenship or whatever it might be to make them eligible for mm -hmm. our national team. But I sure as heck hope that there's something, some document somewhere in the powers that be that have every player that you can imagine, both at a young and older age that uh, could be representatives for our country. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would assume that that has come up and how, hey, are you going to convince, how are you going to convince that guy to play for us and not them um, when they have to make that choice? And yeah, that's a big part of it. And I feel like sometimes you're kind of on Twitter or something. It's like, hey, can Berhalter convince this guy to yeah. play with us and not them? And how's that going to go? Right. Uh, and it feels like you're you're talking about a big, yeah, a five star recruit here for for college programs. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's I think that's up there. I, I, I just hope we don't get caught up in like, let's just hire a guy because he has a name. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think it's a unique job. I don't want someone to come in here and then or when I say I we, you know, that thinks they know it all and then they get frustrated with our pool. Yeah, you know, I think that can potentially happen like, oh, and these guys aren't that good. I mm -hmm. like, when I used to play, I right. So I, that would be my one thing. I'd be like, tell me how you're going to make the most of our pool. Yeah. Put us in the best position, both from our top national teams, men and women's side, down to our, you know, we got to find the U15s now or whatever you want to mm -hmm. say. Um, I, I just think there's a big like, hey, we are who we are. We're, we're not at Brazil yet. We're not there. But how can you how can we get how can we narrow that gap mm -hmm. and not be frustrated along the way and how to uh, view these challenges as good, good challenges that we have to overcome? Um, so that would be kind of where I would be going if I was in the interview as a random Joe Schmo, but I'm yeah. not in there. So, <laughs> well, maybe one day. No, yeah. the, uh, well, I'll, I'll root for that. But the, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you touched on it. The, the American landscape, there's a quantity game and a geographic game there where it, not to insinuate that we have more talent than the likes of Brazil and Argentina, because we don't, but it is more vast and more geographically and more globally spaced out. I mean, I, the, the, like, let's let the, the hypothetical Excel sheet you're talking about, I bet you there might be more names on it than some of those places, because in Argentina and, and certainly in Europe, they're coming from places that it's really concentrated. Like if you're, if you in Holland, for example, if Ajax or PSV don't know about you, they probably don't need to dig a whole lot deeper for you. Whereas in America, the, the gyms, the, the, the you gotta like, you gotta uncover every rock and that's a lot of rocks. And we still don't even really know where the best sources are coming from and there's all different styles. And so it is sort of the ability to manage a, a really uh, a lot of gray area wouldn't you agree yeah and I, and I think you know you talk about geography i mean gone are the days i mean even when you think about you and i playing each other like mm -hmm. charlotte versus greensboro is not what it used to be mainly because now you have charlotte fc and so charlotte fc is going to have to travel uh, i don't want to get too much into like our recruiting but i know that they'll go into like play toronto over in new england on the weekend mm -hmm. you're kind of going well, that's a long weekend. How are you keeping your grades together? How are you doing? Know. You know, you're, <laughs> that's a long way to go for a youth kid. And then all of a sudden, are they starting to get, are they loving it? Or it's, basically it just feels like we're just so spread out and it's harder to get these quality games on a, and so I think it kind of even made it to your point of why it gets so spread out is because we're just spread out and it's hard to get good games all the time mm -hmm. and get the best players get playing against each other. Mm -hmm where sometimes Charlotte versus Greensboro is a good thing. Like mm -hmm. why, why are we, why do we need to abandon that? You yep. know, and I think Charlotte versus Greensboro is happening all over the world, mm -hmm. but even closer than that, it's like Charlotte versus North Charlotte. You know, right. Like you go into places or countries and, and they're great games because all the kids love that, that sport. And mm -hmm. so we're probably never going to get to that point because our country loves tons of sports, mm -hmm. but um, it just feels like it's hard for these, but I'm not, but at the same time, let me, let me comma, but Comma, but I think it's still great that we have this this league and the MLS and the academies they're investing in the youth. So it's like it's just it is who we are. Mm -hmm. We can't run from it. Um, no, right. and you know it's not changing. So like we can't. I just I just don't get into complain mode. It's just like all right, well, all right, we're setting up the best league. Um, yeah, Charlotte should play Nashville, but are they playing? Who are they playing besides that mm -hmm. every other weekend to maybe just get a game in? Um, and so I think there's just a big setup that always needs to be addressed. I mean. When we were growing up, I just loved that there was kind of like a regional team and the regional teams played against each other. Mm -hmm. and from yep. there, they pick a national team because, okay, I'm on the region team for the Southeast and we played against the Northeast and I had a good game. This guy gets, deserves yep. a shot, you know? And That's right. There's some kind of old school fashion to that where it's like, 
that might not be a bad way to identify some domestic players that have not already gone over to Europe. I know, um, I know. And we went away from that um, because they're in these MLS academies. And mm-hmm. and again, that's fine, but... Um, and we kind of chopped it up a bunch more. Yeah, yeah. so sometimes I'm like, well, the Southeast MLS club should have like an all-star team and they should play the Northeast one. Mm-hmm. Let's really start to get these guys playing against each other mm-hmm. more. Yeah. Um, so You touched on, and you're, you're like leading me along here, which is awesome. And again, I don't want you to tell any trade secrets or show us your playbook, but uh, recruiting soccer, that could, probably could not be more of my dream role, just trying to find unearthed gyms. And, you know, walk walk me through, like, January 1, 2023, whiteboard, what do you do? I mean, a lot of questions here, but, you know, do you have sources that you talk to? Because, again, the geographic – like how far geographically do you recruit? Do you typically try to stay in the Southeast or you go nationwide? How do you get your tips? Uh, what grades do you start recruiting in? Yeah. Well, there's all sorts of rules in terms of the grades and when you can to talk to people. Mm-hmm. But from a broad perspective, we, we now recruit globally more than uh, when you and I were growing up. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, so we, we do recruit the whole country. Um, it's a lot, of, a lot of homework, a lot of groundwork that, that you have to cover. But maybe back to the MLS League, uh, uh, as an option, these kids are now having to decide when they're potentially 15, 16, 17, 18, do they want to sign a homegrown deal? Yep. Um, and so we've had kids, and, and I'll go nameless for, for, for everything in terms of covering myself, but <laughs> we've had kids that are committed to Carolina. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, when I say committed, you know, the, the yeah. process of being committed and they're, they're planning on coming. Mm-hmm. Um, and they get a, a contract offer and they don't show up. So I think what's happening – and it's not just our program, so I don't want to say like, oh, this is only a Carolina program no, program, of course not. Yeah. Or, or problem, excuse me. This is happening to other great schools. Is like you want to recruit guys that really want to invest in the, the college experience um, and what it can do for you to, to obviously play at a high level. We feel like the ACC is a, is a high level and Extremely. Is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Um, get a great degree, grow up that, that we had to do um, on this campus from 18 to 22. And so mm-hmm. no one can convince me that going to Carolina is a bad thing. But – I think that there are some people that, you know, Weston McKinney not going to college was a good call. Yeah, you know? right. So, that worked out. So, yeah. so for Carolina, do we want to go after Weston McKinney, even though he may or may not show up? I think mm-hmm. he was committed somewhere, um, mm-hmm. but he never showed up. And so I think that's what the college soccer landscape is now dealing with is like, okay, who's who really wants to be, you know, when you and I were growing up, all I ever wanted to do was play at Carolina. That was, oh, yeah, that was, yeah. You yeah. know, I oh, wasn't. Why? thinking about MLS, maybe the league was too young. And, mm-hmm. and I don't know. I just never viewed it as like, Hey, that's what I want to do. My, my, when I'm playing against you in the state cup in Greensboro, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm one. I love the game. I just wanted to compete, but I was just hopeful that maybe I get that opportunity. Mm-hmm. So I think that mindset's changed a little bit where if I have the opportunity, it's great, but is someone going to pick me up to sign a homegrown deal? That's what kids are now yeah. thinking. Not all of them. I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think those are kind of the big challenges for some of the, higher end programs out there Mm -hmm. Um, and i think because of that if you really did an analysis of some programs out there that are just kind of missing the ncaa tournament once while it's because either their their guys never showed up or they left early and there's no more four-year all acc players like yeah it's just not and you're kind of seeing maybe in the basketball world or whatever yeah that's like hubert davis problems i mean that's like nba and i mean so it's yeah i'm sitting there on the couch watching hubert davis team i'm going oh man i I know what's coming next i mean they've got we got transfer portals we got we got Mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff that he's gonna be thinking about so oh god there's all sorts of uh variables and wild cards out there um but again i maybe back to my original message when we're talking about us soccer i try not to get in complaint mode this is a wonderful place to be just try to make the most of what our environment is and again if it's time for someone to go, it's time for them to go. But again, I, I, no one's going to tell me that coming to University of North Carolina Chapel Hill to play soccer and, and to get a degree is not a good thing. So I'll, we'll keep looking until we find the guys that that want to be here and, and want to try to help us win a title. No, oh, there's plenty. I mean, it's still that's you're near the top of the echelon on any one soccer dreams of the most uh, impossible to reach that there could be, and. Um, but, you know, and again, kind of really getting into the recruiting when you're I mean, this is just a really deep question on style of play. And what are you looking for in recruits? Like a girl that I used to work with asked me and she played in college and she, you know, she was big on like what's the difference between guys and girls. And she was like, what 
what separates the, frankly, what separates the me from the you kind of like can make it all the way at the top flight, you know, in the state and club, you know, now academy level to, okay, now they're playing division D1 soccer. They're really, really good. And I answered her, I was speed. You know, I was like, for us, you kind of got to the top and it was, everyone was really skilled, but it, like yourself and Logan Pauls and Eddie Robinson, Matt Crawford, you know, the list goes on. And Sean McGinty. I mean, I could, there's just no way I could get within 10 yards of you guys. And it was, that's where I was like, all right, this has been awesome, but I'm either going to sit on the bench and, but that's probably, I mean, there's just only so much I can do to get so much faster. What are, what are you looking for when you recruit people? And I know it's probably a little bit of everything, but what catches your attention first? Is it speed? Is it skill? Is it grit and determination? A little bit of all three. Yeah, I, I think I think there's some kind of non-negotiables, right? And some of those might be kind of athleticism, speed, strength, you know, ability on the ball, ability to read the game. There's a lot of these. All right, does this guy just seem like a a well well-rounded player? Mm-hmm. And then past that, you know, we're we're a great institution. We're looking at grades. Mm-hmm. We're looking at how they treat their teammates, how mm-hmm. they treat their coaches. Mm-hmm. Does it feel like they're trying to win that game? Uh, we feel like good players want to win, um, not just kind of do a trick and feel like they're Mm -hmm. something that should empower them to somehow be at Carolina Mm -hmm. because of that one moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think we want consistency, maybe going on that word. Uh, um, Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's, it's a ton of factors. Uh, Obviously it's such a subjective game. You kind of mentioned it early. There might be someone that we pass on and he shows up at the other school that's a Mm -hmm. rival and and does well. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you're also dealing with, the allotment of scholarships uh, at men's soccer programs is you, you can't field a whole team of full scholarships. So sometimes you might run out of some scholarship ability, even though you want that player, you might not be able to afford them based on how good they are. So it's more of a jigsaw puzzle than maybe a basketball where every player on their team might be either full scholarship or walk on, mm-hmm. you know, so there, there's a big jigsaw to it that, that people sometimes don't realize outside of just, is this person good or not? Um, well, that's, to the eye, yeah. That's super cool. That's really interesting. That makes complete sense now that you say it. So it's kind of like you might, in certain scenarios, be like, "Hey, we need we need somebody with speed that can play up top and to fit in this puzzle." Or, yeah. "Nah, we need a really big, strong, you know, one and two touch defender to clean up in the back." So is that fair to say that it's almost you're recruiting to the existing team? Yeah, there's certainly a positional. When you talk about the jigsaw, there's also I, I should have mentioned that there's also a positional need of hey, mm-hmm. this guy. Either a graduating, playing well enough that some pro teams are going to be looking at him. We need to be prepared if he leaves early. You know, mm-hmm. so there's. Um, but you also do like a your own little depth chart of okay, what if this guy goes mm-hmm. down in this position? Are we are we okay still if, mm-hmm. if that guy goes down? Um, uh, so yeah, you're kind of who are we trying to get, but who are we also who do we have in house? Mm-hmm. How's that shape up? Injuries, uh, graduation years. Um, and again, how well are they performing? I mean, there's some guys we just, you just have a, you just have a hunch that if yeah. they have another year, like the one they just had, uh, that might be all she wrote, you know? Right. Well, you, and you hear those stories of Pulisic where these scouts, I think even some European, like a lot of MLS academies just didn't even look at them. And like some European team came and we're looking at someone else and they're like, this is the best kid on the field. He's got the best skill. And again, that hits, that cuts, uh, you know, cuts, to me where you know my youngest son he's really little but he's super good on the ball and i I hope we're you know looking at skill more than size and athletic ability because i feel like when we were kids it was just like (laughs) especially when we got started no one even knew what we were doing it was like following the grateful dead or something it was like just doing it because you love doing it and you have all these big guys. I mean, our Greensboro teams used to be a bunch of big dudes running around and, <laughs> but hopefully we're recruiting for skill a little bit more, you know, now, I mean, you feel like we've yeah. progressed there. I think so. Um, both on the college side and, and, and MLS sides. I mean, I've gone to some games, um, uh, and you're just, you're just like, that kid's got it. I don't care if he's five foot seven. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and look, maybe at some point to, to be a sustained career, maybe he is going to have to grow a little bit, but, mm-hmm. Let's not X him out because he's not big. Right. You know? Right. So I, I think we're past that. I, I, yeah. Can you have 10 of them on the field, though, and a goalkeeper that's big and, and, and rescue them all out? No. I mean, so, no. yeah, we also have to think about uh, when we're recruiting the, the size of our team and can we defend restarts in a way we, we can't have 10 of those guys um, out there. So 
it's still a factor. Mm -hmm. uh, do you wish everybody was six foot two and, and mobile and commute? Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure, it'd be great. Sure, but, uh, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think we. As an example, I, I don't think kids are just being eliminated anymore. Yeah. Maybe the way they were when we were, we growing, were growing up. up. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, well, last question before we jump to the fun rapid fire questions. Do you, you know, outside of your job where you're watching countless amounts of hours of soccer, which again, sounds incredible to me. Um, do you, what do you watch? Do you get to watch much um, outside, you know, watch soccer outside of um, for your job? And what do you watch? Is it EPL, Champions League? Do you watch any MLS? What do you typically yeah. like to watch? You know, I used to be – well, first of all, I have three kids under the age of five. Right. So if I can watch 20 minutes straight of anything, it's a, it's a dream. Right, it's yeah. Um, but kind of brings up a point that, you know, when you and I were growing up, it was hard to catch a game. But, I, you know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. fun that I can turn the TV on on a weekend and, and watch the Premier League. That, that's probably the, the most that I watch is that league because of the sure. accessibility on the weekend. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The popularity of it. The timing of it. The timing of it is yeah. huge. Um, I was an MLS guy when it was like, they used to have like a Sunday games when it was like three and six o'clock. And it was mm -hmm. just like perfect. And mm -hmm. a lot of guys that the names you're mentioning were my dear friends, let alone oh, yeah. my teammates. And, yeah. and so like, I felt really connected to the league and I'm not saying I'm not connected to the league now because we have players that are in the league, mm -hmm. but man, when your friend is out there uh, yeah. playing, you're really invested in that team. I'm mm -hmm. like, Logan Paul, is, I, I love the Chicago Fire. Oh, yeah. I, me too. They're, like the, they're, they're not that great recently, and I still like the no. Chicago Fire. <laughs> no, I watched them every time I could, and yeah. uh, all these so, guys. Um, th th those kind of things. I mean, you, you know, Eddie Robinson, who grew up in Greensboro. Eddie, gosh, you were watching the San Jose Earthquakes and the Houston Dynamo just trying to yeah, get man. a glimpse of Eddie hit somebody because yeah. I took I took those knees to the quads like all I the did time. Too. I mean, getting hit by Eddie is, a, is oh, an yeah. eye-opening experience, and so – yeah, as I joked when he was on, I said if he was within ten or fifteen yards, you better you better get rid of it. Yeah, he's coming. Yeah, he's coming. He doesn't. He doesn't fast. care. Yeah, uh, if he's late, he doesn't. He's coming. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah. All right, we're well, kind of jiving into the rapid fire questions. Um, who's the best player you ever played with or against? Um, I think so. I went to like you know they had this camp called the the uh, ESP when we were growing up, I think it was called the elite soccer program. They invited kids to this, it was Virginia beach. And, uh, oh, yeah, I Marcus before. Beasley was our year and I was oh, nice. yeah. playing against Marcus Beasley a lot. Um, he's one of my all time year, favorites, you know? Um, and that's when, that's when it was like almost abnormal. Like who's this guy that's about to sign where, you know, you're mm -hmm. like, and he's just like buzzing up around the field. He's elusive. He's clean on the ball. So that might be, that's a good in one. In real time, I knew it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe there's better answers. You know, obviously Logan. You know, all the all my teammates at Carolina that yeah. went on to have like great MLS mm -hmm. careers, and I kind of you know was just around them daily, which made it fun. But like kind of in that moment, like lining up against them, and, and I think I was on his team a few times because they kind of mixed up the group sometimes. But mm -hmm. Demarcus was like, "All right, yeah, this guy's going to be in a World Cup quarterfinal in whatever years." Yeah, that's yeah. a great answer. And for me, selfishly, like for my answer for that is you and Eddie and Logan and Crawford and Sean and, you know, a bunch of others. And, um, there's a handful, you know, it's funny for you and I, I feel like back in the day, there were some kids when we were like 14, 15, 16, that were even better, but they peaked, you know, the, the Craig fault of the world, Keith Rice back in the day. The, yeah. But, it, but I, what I'm, where I'm going with this is that it was, it's awesome that I, I didn't get to play with Demarcus Beasley, but I played with people that played with Demarcus Beasley, and that's yeah. a Demarcus Beasley is in the conversation for best American of all time. So yeah. um, that's a can't can't get much yeah. of a better answer than that. What's What's interesting about growing up in the state of North Carolina too, and I, I say this sometimes when I have to talk to groups, but some people are geographically, you know, it goes back to our geography mm -hmm. talk. We're, growing up in the state of North Carolina was was and is a special place to grow up on a mm -hmm. soccer front in terms of the 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 players that have been that come out of the state um that you could probably have on your po podcast all day every day oh yeah i mean i got 25 years. it's yeah. crazy and uh and then i have the great universities and so i just felt like it was very fortunate to to grow up in here uh, in, in charlotte and, and obviously now to be at carolina is special but um it's just a great state great soccer state yeah and you know you, you 
I'm definitely that old fogey dad now with my two sons in the back. And it's what get back to watching soccer. What's so cool now, as opposed to when we grow up is we, we watch Boca river games. We watch Roma versus Lazio. We watch, mm -hmm. we watch Celtic versus Rangers this past weekend. I'm explaining yeah. the dynamics of that and how, you know, the, the, the religious undertones and, you know, yeah. so there's exposed to a lot more, but I was telling them, you know, I, talk about all you guys you know occasionally of my old days and they're always trying to figure out where i was on the you know pecking order and and i can i can you know six degrees of kevin bacon i can two degrees it to like people that were playing in the world cup and stuff which is like hey i make it all the way but i made it to the bottom of the ninth and you know whereas you guys i consider made it all the way um but that's a great answer um so number two messi or ronaldo I go Messi. Um, one because my kids love Messi, so it's almost yeah, like too. they make me they make me love Messi. But uh, I don't know. It's something about this World Cup that really um, it's hard to argue with. The deal for me, uh, mm -hmm. the way they were doing it, and mm -hmm. I, it, you know, I we're not there, so we can't see all the cameras. But he seemed as some of those games were intense and kind of maybe getting a little out of control, and you see some people acting certain ways where you're like. Eh, it felt like Messi kind of just stayed in there. I was like, I'm going to win this World Cup title. I don't care what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. Is he proud of all of his actions in the World Cup? Maybe not. I don't know. But, like, it just felt like he was – I'm not leaving here without this without this title. And mm -hmm. when you're when you're not totally invested – I mean, I'm, I'm invested. But, like, when you're not totally invested in that final and you're just watching, you're like, I just can't help but root for this guy. And then somehow oh, he kind of yeah. ended the the debate for me on, on this one. Mm -hmm. Um that night i think for probably 75 percent, that is pretty decidedly so it's funny my oldest son is big ronaldo and my youngest son is diehard messy because my younger son is little and left-footed so of course she nice. has gravitated towards him and they like legitimately argue about it like really and i'm like hey hey, hey. it's like there's <laughs> there's no the the fun in this is just that there's no right That's answer right. but um right. so uh messy or maradona I'd probably say Messi only because it's more, um, I was so, I don't want to say I was um, not paying attention at that young age, mm -hmm. but I, I just feel like I grew up more with Messi or more in my young adult life and, sure. and into my adult life to appreciate him more than maybe I would have realized um, if I was growing up in that era, not to say I didn't see him play, but I was almost too young to process mm -hmm. just how good Maradona was. Now, yeah, I, uh, that might be a cop out answer. That'd be like saying Michael Jordan versus LeBron, and I think this generation is saying it's LeBron. It's LeBron. What are you talking about? Right. I'm like, Wait a second here. Like Michael was Michael. He's too yeah. good. Like yeah, he would average uh, this, this, and this. You know. Um, so like on the on the Michael LeBron, I go towards Michael because I grew up with him. But sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm more like the Messi because I feel like I've been around and watched his mm -hmm. elite moments as a as an adult or young adult. Yeah, I mean it's it's a tough one for me on that one. The thing about the Maradona, I mean, Messi is, I mean, there's, you really can't go wrong with that answer pretty much for anything. But with Maradona, I really did that. He's kind of what made me fall in love with the game. I was just like, yeah. you know, as a 10 year old, I kind of, I'm that 90 world cup in Italy. I remember just yep. being yep. like, that's my guy. He yep. was like, you know, Mick Jagger out there or something like he just had that. And I was like, I don't know what this whole scene's about, but I, deal, <laughs> deal me in. Like, yeah, I want to, I want to, uh, you know, not all the bad stuff, but like, he was just his, his attitude and like little guy of like, I'll take on, I'll go, I'll That's go right. with anybody. And, and he's um, drawing cows as he's dribbling the whole team. Oh yeah. yeah just, those clips are another level, but yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, so who you got Ronaldo or Ronaldo? So Cristiano versus Il Phenomeno. I go Cristiano on that one. Yeah. Um, me too. I don't know if I have like a, the cleanest answer why besides that, man, he's just another level. I, I mean, um, you know, the and what he's done to try to get Portugal to a place where they mm -hmm. might win a, a, a World Cup or, you know, I don't know. I, I, somehow I just lean towards Cristiano and I don't have the cleanest answer for that. It's mm -hmm. just more of a gut, like that's my more of my guy than Brazilian Ronaldo. Yeah, and, I, and it's funny though cuz it seems like the obvious one longevity goals accolades sure. notwithstanding but um but still you have some of these you know again the first Ronaldo was kind of our era too very much and you have yeah. people that will argue yeah. till the end of time that no he was the peak 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 of all time. 
Um, but that's a good one. How, who do you got, Donovan or Dempsey? <sighs> I probably, I, I, I'm probably, I lean more towards Landon Donovan. Mm -hmm. um, and again, maybe because I was a little bit more his time age wise. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, something about that 2002 run was so big for us soccer and his, he is a big image of that for me mm -hmm. um, beating Mexico in the round of 16. Something about him was just like yeah. the forefront of that, not to undermine any other players, but mm -hmm. like, just felt like he really was big on that and, and an ambassador for almost setting up Clint Dempsey as he, as he kind of did his run mm -hmm. of, of performances. Yeah. Um, so I, I lean towards Land Donovan. So yeah, that's that's a tough one. I know these are all tough. There's no right answer, yeah. um, and we're not trying to make enemies with any of these guys because they're all the best. Yeah. But um, very apropos for you and me, again, kind of themed of the show. Who's your favorite center mid of all time? Oh, all time. It's probably like a Zidane. Yeah, Ronaldinho. Mm -hmm territory mm -hmm. yeah um you know i've been a big fan of luka modric these last Oof, yeah you know i don't know if he's the all-timer but man he's just fun to watch and you talk about little guys i mean i don't know what his actual height is but he just i saw him live um one time the way he manipulates the the field and space to his advantage and to his teammates advantages you you said it earlier you can't put a stat sheet on that he he's no. doing things that are next level and sometimes he's not even touching the ball. It's just about where he's standing and where he's going to be. And you can say that about lots of elite players. But when you're live and you see what he's doing and how effortless it looks, um, that'd be more of my current version. But then I'd lean historically to kind of the, the Zidane Ronaldinho. I'm glad you mentioned that Luka Modric point because it's like it touches on, to me, the art of soccer in that, you know, when I watch it with watch soccer with my dad, can he, he fell in love with the game watching me grow up and he always wished man i wish this had existed when i was coming along because he was like me not super tall trying to play point guard and running back and stuff and uh he was like i would have been great at this but he doesn't see what i see in that like what you just mentioned is kind of what it's all about for me is that he's modric is the, the guy behind the guy kind of sometimes and he's the dummy run that get leads benzema to get the open goal he's yeah. not always yeah, in fact, that's probably why he you know, he was voted World Player of the Year, rightly so. But he's not going to get the most goals. And, like, yeah. that doesn't – that's tough to click with a lot of – I don't mean yeah. to make this American versus the world, but there's just off-the-ball runs. There's, you know, my dad – people that even are fans, they don't see the pass that leads to the pass. You know, yeah. and he was that – he's that guy. He's the guy that kind of creates something out of nothing. Um, that wasn't there before, and so I, I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, all right, so let's get your my favorite one. Get your your perfect eleven of all time. Um, so I, I did. I, I got like a four three three version. I guess I, I put um, Ronaldo, Messi, and Pele up up top. Pele's the only one in my lineup that I would that I really didn't. It just feels like he has to be in there. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> because he he is who he is, even yeah. though I wasn't like who I was growing up with. And, he was the first. Um, that was kind of my, my front three and it's hard to argue against Messi and Ronaldo and, and, and Pele. So I think it's a, sure. it's a pretty good, then I think it's I'm kind okay of, with that, yeah, yeah I, <laughs> my three midfielders, I have Zidane holding with Ronaldinho and then Maradona as like a underneath the, mm -hmm. the boards mm -hmm. trying to make some things happen. Yeah, so well, argue that number 10. Yeah, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep him in there. Mm -hmm. um, in the back, um, I have Roberto Carlos on the left back sure. and I slide Maldini in just to keep both those guys. Yeah. If you part of it, Maldini has uh, got to be in. Yeah. And then the other center back, I had Sergio Ramos, um, sure. mainly cause my, my team's looking a little soft here. So we got to hit some people, mm -hmm. you know? Um, sure. 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 You no, know, we gotta be, we gotta, still gotta be tough. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I was leaning towards like a, a Philip Lom or, or Cafu on the right, but I'll, I'll go with, um, uh, Philip Lom just cause mm -hmm. you know, you're captaining, national teams and Champions League yeah. titles, you got something going on. And then I got Buffon and goal only sure. because of his personality. I think he gives like that Italian rigidness that will keep us organized. Yep. Um, and he's still pretty good. <laughs> so He's uh, arguably the best. Yeah. It's, um, those are mine. I, I you know, Goalkeeper I was struggling with, but um, we need some some discipline back there and a little bit of personality just sure. to, 
to, to, to do the, the uh, smacking a little, uh, talk a little smack back there. Sure. Um, she got yeah. to, got to. Who do you have in so goal? That's my, yeah, Buffon. Yeah, Buffon. Oh, you, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Good. And then um, last question, favorite jersey of all time? Jeez, I feel like what hits my head when you ask that, I'm just going to go old school with the American. There was like the three stripes that went from like your shoulder into the center of the chest. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, man. That was like. Yeah. Was that 1990 or I don't know? Yeah, it's man. not really a good jersey. It's it's probably terrible looking, but somehow it's. I love it. That's the first one that one. hit my mind when you said that question, because uh, I wasn't prepared for it. But there's probably better looking versions. I'll always go with a, a Carolina jersey that you see behind me. I always love our light blue. Yeah, oh, uh, you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm always on board with light blue, but I'll go with the American three stripes when we used to be Adidas. No, that's uh, that's a good one. Um, well, that's it, man. And, um, dude, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I hope man. you got fun with this and I yeah, can't okay. tell you how much that I appreciate it. And, um, you know, again, to the listeners out here, this has been Grant Porter on the center mid philosopher, my least favorite player to ever play against in the most complimentary way. Cause he tor it. torched me. Um, and, uh, one of the best to ever play in North Carolina, continuing to, um, do brilliant things as a coach now. And I'm, I'm, I'm just happy that one of our own is still uh, carrying the torch. So thank you. And it's been an honor and a pleasure. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. And come on up. Get your kids to a game. Let's do it. Uh, dude, I'm on it. We're going to do it. Like, I, I'll absolutely do that. We didn't even get to talk to you about the Chelsea-Wrexham game. But, well, uh, yeah, I'm. you know, maybe we'll, uh, that one. Let's maybe, go. we'll tailgate. <laughs> yeah. All right, bud. Thank you All so right. much. I'll yeah, no problem. Get thank back you, to Grant. it. This is Zach. Thank you, Grant. Appreciate it, man. Thanks to all the listeners. Uh, go out there and be a true center mid in life. Create art out of nothing. Create beauty out of chaos. Support your friends, your coworkers, your teams. Put good karma out there. Uh, set someone else up for success. And last of all, put one on net. Thanks.